The Celebration Bowl has moved to the second Saturday in December. It was a necessary move for the event. However, one conference comes out as a big-time loser due to the rescheduling. Oh, yeah, it's locked on, HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South. Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor and current contributing writer at USA Today Saints Wire. Thank you for going on this journey with me. Make a locked on HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. It just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Starts with an S and ends with an S. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. In these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. And that's why LinkedIn Jobs wants you to help or wants to help find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions do apply. We wrap up today's episode with a look at a little bit of controversy a little under the radar controversy around UAPB baseball. Prior to that, we'll look at the track and field national results for some of our athletes who are competing in the event. But we kick this off with what I think needs to be a declaration, and that's the SWAC is the biggest losers in the Celebration Bowl rescheduling. Now, I'm going to say it again. And I'm going to give credence to why the, 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 the game needed to be moved. But let's not get it twisted off rip. The SWAC is the biggest losers in the Celebration Bowl moving up one week. Now, if you were tired, if you were exhausted, if you were irritated by the fact that the SWAC was complaining about, hey, you know, we only have X amount of time versus these guys who have this amount of time. If you were irritated by this narrative, prepare to be absolutely infuriated because it's only going to get worse. And honestly, I think it's deservedly so. I was on your side. I didn't think that the time difference was something that needed to be a talking point continuously. But now that they've changed the date from the third Saturday to the second Saturday in December, I think that SWAC fans, SWAC teams, SWAC coach, I do believe that they have a legitimate gripe when speaking about the difference in rest time prior to the game than the MEAC has. Because now they have no rest time. There is no week in between. There is nothing that I can latch on and say, at least you have this. I don't I don't think that exists anymore. And I believe that that is a, a real thing to talk about. If you want to accuse me of crying about it, that's OK, because I'm not. If you want to accuse me of crying about it, that's OK, because you're probably biased. I don't believe that I'm going to get on here and I'm going to cry about it. I believe that I'm going to address something that needs to be addressed. And I believe that is a disadvantage to the swag. If that constitute is crying about it, then may it be what it be. But if it doesn't, which it doesn't to me, then allow me to break down this situation and look at the impact of the celebration bowl moving from where they were. Let's first get to why they had to do it. This was a necessary move. This isn't a, they wanted to do it. So they did it. It was kind of a no one told you to do it, but smart business would say the third Saturday does not work now. The third Saturday probably won't work going forward because the expansion of the college football playoffs has forced the hand of the MEAC and the SWAC because it's always been promoted as the kickoff to bowl season. Now, I don't know if that was a a marketing ploy from bowl season or if this was just a marketing ploy by the SWAC and MEAC, I would assume that is the latter because it's an FCS bowl as opposed to an FBS bowl like all the other ones. But I think that it was a good marketing ploy, and I also think that it was good timing. You didn't have to compete with anybody. If they would have kept the Celebration Bowl on the 21st, I believe it would be this, this year, 
on the 30 on the 21st, you would have been looking at competing with college football playoffs. That's not going to work out for you. Even if the timing is different, you're working, you're probably working against other playoff or a bowl games. Matter of fact, if you're looking specifically at 2024, Right. If you're looking specifically at 2024, you're looking at the NFL and the college football players that you would have had to compete against. That's all day. And none of those are things that you really want to compete against because that is a losing battle. Now, moving forward in the 2025, 2026, I don't know if the NFL will do what they did, because honestly, I think that this was honestly a, a, a power play. I think this was a statement. I've seen them do this to the NBA on Christmas Day. Now it seems like why are you putting games on a Saturday? When you know the college football playoffs are kicking off, it just feels it just feels like a power play. I don't know if they'll do that the following years, but I'll tell you what, even if the NFL doesn't continue this in 2025 and beyond, you're still going to have to deal with the college football playoffs. And that's still not something that I want to compete against. I still think that's something that's going to knock down your ratings. I think it's going to knock down your your audience. I think it's going to limit your scope because you had the advantage of saying I'm kicking off bowl season and I'm relatively unopposed. So that's why you move it up a week so that you can maintain that same leverage. Here's the thing, though, when we're speaking about leverage, the SWAC has none. You get into this. I believe that this is great. I believe it was a necessity. You keep it on ABC. You get this wide scope. You have everything that you already had. It's just a different date. The problem becomes when you get to the SWAC. And when you get to the SWAC, you have zero time off. After the SWAC championship, the next week is the Celebration Bowl. And unfortunately, you can't change that. You have the Bayou Classic and you have the Turkey Day Classic. Those are both centered around Thanksgiving, and I don't really feel like you can change it. Some tradition can't be messed with, and I feel like that one can't. Heck, you got Turkey Day in the, in the freaking name, the Turkey Day Classic. What you going to play it on? If, it's, if you're going to play the Turkey Day Classic on any other day, please tell me the day that actually makes sense. Because to me, the only day that makes sense is Turkey Day, right? Like, I, I, we're just being honest here. So we know that moving the, the 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 SWAC championship is not happening. It's not going to happen. So what's your next alternative? Do you have one? No, because you can't move it up a week because that's the same week as the SWAC cha- or the, uh, the Bayou Classic and the Turkey Day Classic. What if those teams have to play in the SWAC championship? That's a huge disadvantage. That's a bigger disadvantage than the than the celebration bowl thing that we're just talking about right now. Right. Like like if we're just talking about advantages and disadvantages, you can't make them play on a shortened week to a Sunday. No, that doesn't work that way. My problem is what other sport, what other football championship, what other football championship do you see in which you have the game to make it to the big dance or whatever you want to call it? The Super Bowl, the college football championship is the only one. It's the only one. And that's because they have a month off before their only previous game. Like if we're, if we're just speaking honest, all right, the SWAT gets a raw end of the deal because they're going to have to do something that you don't see people do. AFC, NFC championship game, and then you have a week off before the Super Bowl. If you want to look at the college football playoffs, you have a month off. You have a month off, and then you play a semifinal game, and then you play another game after that. The SWAC has no time off, and they have an entire season. This, to me, is a huge disadvantage. Meanwhile, the MEAC will be playing at the end of November. You'll have one, two, three. You'll have two weeks off. We'll say two weeks off because then you have game week. The MEAC gets to go into the biggest game of the season, whoever that representative is gets to go into the biggest game of the season on two weeks rest compared to the SWAC's no rest. I was on your side when you had that week off. It's cool. You get a week to get your body right. You get a week to do. And you know that the celebration or the MEAC team typically is going to let their players go back for Thanksgiving. They might not get active right away, but I can guarantee you that game planning is going to start the week of the SWAC championship. Even if you have to split up the attention that's being given to the West champion and the East champion, You can spend that first week dividing up game plans for both teams if you wanted to. The swag doesn't have that luxury. What you going to do? Start game planning for Howard when you got um, Prairie View on your side? Fam, you would have never done that. Fam, you has to dedicate their attention to Prairie View in that situation. Right? Like, like if we're just talking, I'm just trying to be honest, and I don't believe that is an even exchange when you're looking at 
what happens. Somebody had to get the short end of the stick and it had to be the swag because the moves are because of dates that they simply cannot change. And that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. I believe that the MEAX rest influence was something that I brushed off. Now it's something that I can't ignore. If you want to say that I'm crying about it, pass me some tissues. I really don't care because I know the truth is whatever it's going to be is what it's going to be. But we have to address that the SWAC is getting a very short end of the stick when it comes to the Celebration Bowl preparation. Now, as we push forward, we're going to move on from that. We'll probably attack that closer to the Celebration Bowl, maybe even closer to the season, to be honest. But now I want to look at Caleb Snowden out of University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. We're wrapping up the season, or wrapping up the show with two UAPB topics. But Snowden got a medal at the track and field nationals, and I should have given him more attention leading up to the event than I really did. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn, and LinkedIn Jobs wants to help you find the right person for your job for free. It's a win-win. Where is the lose in this situation? You go to LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. You don't pay any money. You get to post your job for free. For free. That means no, no risk, all reward because of everybody who has posted their job on LinkedIn. 86%, 86% of small businesses that have done this have found the right person, the right candidate for their team faster. And it's been within one day. So it's on you. If you're a small business owner who is not using LinkedIn, I have to question how serious you're taking this. Because LinkedIn is going to have all of the rep uh, resumes. It's going to have all of the I know who this person is moments. You have everything you could possibly ask for on LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. So post your job for free and get the right candidate faster. All you have to do is go to LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions do apply. As we continue rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day for your second listen. Make sure you're checking out Locked on Sports today. It's the first of its kind, 24-7, all day, every day, Live Sports Network on YouTube. Now, Caleb Snowden grabs a medal at Track and Field Nationals, and he is the only Division I athlete to catch a or Division I HBCU athlete to get a medal at this event. I spent the track and field cycle primarily focusing on Jamarion Stubbs, and he's the person who I really hitched my wagon to. I had a lot of big things to say about him, none of which I regret. None of which I regret, but in hindsight, in hindsight, I can admit that I probably should have given equal amount of attention to Caleb Snowden because he has been doing this. This is no disrespect to, to Stubbs. In no way am I going to say, man, I shouldn't have focused on Stubbs. I should have focused on this guy. No, I should have given Stubbs everything that I gave him leading up to this event. I just also should have given Snowden that same attention because the UAP, the UAPB high jumper has been doing this for a while. Like this is very consistent of him. And I actually think that's a little bit of a, uh, a difference between the two athletes, between Stubbs and Snowden, is the consistency throughout the year versus the late season consistency. Right. Um, but with Snowden, you're looking at a guy who <clears throat> he won every single meet he was at. Every meet he was at, Snowden was the victor. So you're looking at a, 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 a an athlete who has has been accustomed to winning you look and i'm speaking on the outdoor season not indoor but outdoor victory victory first 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 i go to his profile and all you see is first all the way down the line i think he may have had one second in a uh a prelim and then in the finals he ended up getting first place there but in the end he ended up getting third place and it's not his first time meddling at track and field nationals when you look at outdoors he got third in indoor season which was a couple of months ago he got second. So this is the second time that he's been on the podium. In the indoor season, he was the first UAPB high jumper to get a medal. Now, when you're looking at winning in the same season, indoor, outdoor, meddling, he's the first HBCU high jumper to medal in both of these events on a national level, excuse me, ever. So when I'm looking at him, man, I'm looking at a guy who he jumped seven, three and three quarters at at nationals and he came in third like i said second time that he meddled i should have given him more shine i should have given him more attention than i did and that's okay 
Um, but I focused on Stubbs because he was going crazy in an event that everybody was looking towards. He was going crazy in the 200. He made two nationals in the 100. So looking at two sports, two, two events, or excuse me, two events that he not only succeeded at a high level with, but then also there are two events that are very high profile. People show up for the 100. People want to see the sprints, the 100, the 200. That's what people want to see, the 110 hurdles, the four by one. Like these are things that people are gravitating towards and making sure that they're in their seat. My sister ran track and field. The four by one was one of those. The 100 was one of those. I think the 200 was. And the four by four. People love the four by four. Um, but yeah. Anyway, Stubbs still made it to Eugene in the 100 and the 200, and I just I'm kind of disappointed to be honest. I'm kind of disappointed in what he was able to do because I had a lot of confidence that this guy would be on the podium at the end. I thought that him and Snowden would have the same fate, but unfortunately, Stubbs picked the wrong time to have his worst run or his second worst run of the year. He ran a 20. He won. He ran a twenty fifty nine, and in that, he's only ran that worse once. He ran a twenty one at some point, and then he ended up coming back, and that was in the the semifinal. So in the next round, he made it. <clears throat> actually, that was at a uh, Sweat Nationals. That was at Sweat Nationals. It was right before he actually went on this hot streak of his. Excuse me, let me get myself together. But when you look at the difference between Snowden and Stubbs, it's not just how. They went out. It wasn't just, oh, Stubbs was seventh. Snowden was third. It wasn't just that. It's their whole path to this event. For Snowden, I'm breaking down first after first after first after first after first. He's done this at a high level consistently. Coming into nationals, he had the second highest high jump of any athlete in the country. Right? It's one of the reasons I love track and field because the number is the number. Now you look at Stubbs. And Stubbs had a really great stretch, but Stubbs was the, the team, if we're doing analogy, Stubbs was the team that got hot late in the season. And those are the guys that you think can ride that way throughout the postseason. And he did to a certain extent. But really, honestly, his hot streak was his last four races prior to this. So his final race at the SWAC National Champ or at the SWAC Championships, and then his three races at nationals, pre first round quarterfinals, semifinals. Those were the four best runs of his season. So when you trace back exactly what Stubbs was able to do, specifically at Nationals, man, it makes me very disappointed that he ran a 20.59 in the finals. This was his first run of the event. He ran a 20.02, he ran a 19.95, and he ran a 20.15. All of those numbers are really good. And all of those numbers, honestly, uh, they would have had him top four. I think he might have missed out. I think he might have missed out on third with a 2015. But I said it before. If he could break the 20 threshold, he's going to be competing to win. And he would have been at worst second because he ran a 1995. Let's say he would have ran that again. The other runner who ran first place, it was the first. Uh, it was a Penn State sprinter who got first place in this event. He was the only other runner to cross the 20 second threshold. And he ran a 1995. So now we would have had to get to the hundredth place to see who would have came out victorious in that. You're looking at if he would have ran a 2002 again, he's looking at second place because he would have been, man, this was just a thing where I said it. Hey, if he runs better than a 21, you're looking at a guy who's on the podium and he would have been only, there was one guy who broke the 20 threshold. There was one guy who broke the 20.1 threshold. He would have been on point if he just ran better than a 21, a 20.1, 20 excuse me. But unfortunately he ran a 2059. It was the worst time to have that it was a very hot stretch a lot of times he was running the the 20.4s right he was i think he got a 20.3 somewhere in there he had a couple 20.49s like that that was his his range so i guess the 2059 isn't so far from his range but it's the fact that he had heated up prior to this that really makes it disappointing but that's okay um because he still was a first team all american because he finished top 8 same with Snowden. Both of these players or both of these athletes were first team all Americans. Now, I want to push forward to a little bit more controversy and look at UAPB baseball because this is a controversy that has ran a little bit under the radar. But I want to remedy that because I want to highlight something within it that is a small part of a bigger conversation. 
Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. And FanDuel is the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. The NBA Finals are moving over to Dallas. Boston is done. Boston is done. And now we're going to have two games in Dallas. It's a very exciting time. I still suggest that you put down your money on who you believe will be the MVP of this whole thing. Because I know it's fluid Luca. Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, those comments by Jason Kidd were, whoo, they were something else. I'll tell you that. But anyway, all you have to do, if you're new to FanDuel, is put down a $5 winning bet and you'll get $150 back in bonus bets. The same goes with the Stanley Cup. Uh, I'm sure they probably got odds on who's going to be the Lakers next head coach. They probably have odds on uh, baseball. They do have odds on baseball all the time. All you have to do is go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. And remember, if you put down a $5 winning bet, you'll get $150 back in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day, making it all the way to segment three, and I thank you two times for that. Thank you. Thank you. There's some controversy out there at UAPB. Now, I haven't heard much about it from others, but I did read this article, and I wanted to shine a light on it myself. Former UAPB baseball coach who was just fired less than a month ago, less than three weeks ago, to be honest. Um, He's revealed that he believes he was fired because he spoke up about the financial obstacles that he was faced during his time at UAPB. I'm not here to agree. I'm here to take his claim and look into not only what he said, but then also a small part of why this is a bigger conversation that kind of comes up in different ways. But this is what he said. I've been here. Carlos James said this. I've been here 14 years and we've never been fully funded. The other schools have continued to fund their programs to the point where it keeps us last. Believe it or not, our guys fight as best they can. And with and with but with only the amount of scholarships we have, it's only so many quality players that you can get. He made these comments in mid-May. He was fired at the end of May. Now, granted, this was a couple of days after the after the season had ended that he made these comments. Two weeks after your season ending, being fired is not rare. So it's not as if the season was over for a month. He made those comments and he was gone two weeks later. But I just feel like given that timeline as far as credence to what he said, but then also understanding that's not the end all be all. You cannot. We don't know for sure if that's the reason he was fired, but that's the reason he feels. So when you look at fully funded and the scholarships, what is he talking about? The NCAA allows you to have 11.7 scholarships for baseball. So that's a mixture of full and partial scholarships. That comes out to whatever amount of money that it comes out to. That is your allotment that you can give out in scholarships. They, at UAPB, at the time of his firing, had four. And when he was hired, they had six. So he's always been working with half of what he could possibly have. And then it worked down to a third of what he could possibly have. That's unacceptable. And, you know, that's not a lot. Half or and, and, and it's even for SWAC schools, it's not a lot because James spoke about how he's talked to other players who have said, hey, I went here because they could give me more scholarship money. And that's real. You know, it's not even NIL deals and look, they had more scholarships. So I went there. You're working at a disadvantage. And he's speaking about. Hey, there's only so many quality players you can get. Here goes another quote. He said, I can't afford him. Talking about just any random player. So I got to go get a guy who I got to go get a guy that just wants an opportunity and probably didn't even play a lot where he came from. And I got to come in here and try to make him a player. It's just not working out. You have to catch them on good days. And that's tough. I would hate to hear that as a player, to be honest. But as a person who's not a player and a person who's not you know, even closely invested in this, as far as on a personal level. He's telling you that he's got guys who don't deserve to be playing D1 baseball. That's what he's saying. I have players who should not be on the D1 level, but I got to come in and I got to work with what I got. I'm doing with scraps, you know, and, 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 and listen, listen, the budget that they have is smaller, about half is half the size of University of Arkansas, Little Rock, which is in the same system. That's the money that they're dealing with. That's the money that they're dealing with. They got messed up fields. They got all of these things. They're like, hey, you're not 
going towards the budget for coaching. You're not going towards the budget for uh, improvements of the field. The scoreboard keep going out. You're not uh, you're not giving me scholarships. You're not doing anything that's going to help this program win. And I think that let's say he was fired for speaking his mind. He came up and said, I've been always taught to speak my mind, especially when I know I'm telling the truth. My struggles as far as scholarships and things like that just continue to get worse. And it was more of a cry for help than anything. Sometimes people take that the wrong way and it leads to other things. Well, your cry for help ended up being a, a two week notice, almost literally. But the problem is some we're fighting the fight and we know that. But sometimes when you fight the fight and you look to change narratives, you also look the other way to things that don't support what you're trying to build towards because you know that there's a negative stigma around you. You don't want to acknowledge things that could contribute to that stigma. Instead, you're only leaning into the things that combat the stigma. And I believe that when you do that, when you do that, you don't give room for true progress. Because, yes, you're going to get better, but you're also going to ignore your deficiencies. And in order to really improve, you have to improve your deficiencies. It can't only be we're going to do these good things, good things, good things. And you got all these bad things. Well, now these bad things are still weighing you down. And your program is not growing. And if you turn a blind eye or if you fire a coach who speaks on this. You know, so I'll leave it at that. But also, no, I won't. This very well could be the reason he was fired, but it's also important to acknowledge they haven't been good in seven, eight years, right? Like the success has not been around for them. One could say it's because of the reasons he's pointing out, and that's why he pointed them out. But I do want to give the other side that you have to be successful. And if you're not successful, it always gives you a way to be out. I don't know who told the truth, but I wanted to make sure I spoke on that aspect right here and reported this to you. Now, on Wednesday's episode, we'll be back. Remember, we're three days a week now, so we'll be back on Wednesday's episode, I I believe, segment three, because I'm trying to do some fun things for segment three. It'll be about Asia Wilson's HBCU roots and why she could potentially play a CP3 type role for HBCU women's basketball. I'm excited for that one. So um, that'll be Wednesday's episode, likely. Now, in the meantime, in between time, till we get to Wednesday, take care, stay blessed, peace.